Thank you so much, Councilperson Barker, for your support to everyone who has gathered here from this community and all around. Thanks for making us feel right at home. I've been trying to sort out my Iowa County names relative to Indiana County names because we were in Scott County earlier. My mom's from Scott County, Indiana. We were in Knoxville. We don't have a Knoxville, but we have a Knox County, which is not to be confused with where Knox is, which is in Stark County. Now, of course, Knoxville here is in Marion County. We got a Marion County, but that's not where Marion is. Marion's in Grant County. But this is definitely the only Maquoketa that I've ever been to. If I'm going to ask you to figure out how to say Buttigieg, I figured I'd better learn how to say Maquoketa. <laughs> I'm so thankful that you've taken the time to come together to discuss something that it is of utmost importance, uh, even more than in most presidential elections, because it's the question of what kind of country we want to live in. That's what I believe is at stake right now. And the good news is, it's up to us. And in particular, it's up to you, Iowa, because Iowa has a thumb on the scale in making that decision about the nomination and therefore the presidency and therefore the future of this country. And I have seen over the course of the last year how seriously Iowans take that responsibility. And I also can feel right now in Iowa that it's getting to be decision time, that the folks who are saying things like, well, you're in my top seven over the summer <laughs> are now in decision mode. And for those of you who are on board, I'm here to thank you and to urge you to recruit others into this cause. And thanks to everybody who's a supporter. For those of you still thinking it over, I'm here to ask you to caucus for me in order to make it possible for our country to tackle the biggest issues that we face and to do it in a way that's actually going to unify our nation. To give you a sense of what is going to be required of the presidency. I want to begin by asking you to, to paint a picture in your own mind, really visualize, close your eyes if you want to even, and visualize how it's going to feel when the sun comes up over Maquoketa and Donald Trump is no longer the president of the United States. Let that image soak in. Isn't it a relief just to remember that one way or the other that day will come? <laughs> I think we're, we're ready to put that, that chaos behind us and put this corruption in the rearview mirror and to not wake up and wonder what tweet emanated from the Oval Office today, just to put that behind us. But the reason I'm asking you to picture that day is to think about what we're going to need, what work will begin, not end, on that day. Because the sun will be coming up over a country even more divided than we are now. Think about it. We're going to be even more torn up by politics, even more exhausted from fighting than we are today. So we're going to need a president who understands how to unify this nation and move it in a common direction. And something else will be true at the same time, which is the problems that helped our country get to this point will only be more severe. They're not going to take a vacation during the election or the impeachment process. The sun will be coming up over a country where it is no longer possible for someone working full time at minimum wage to afford a two bedroom apartment in any county in the United States of America. The sun will be coming up in a climate that is this close to the point of no return. It will be coming up over schools where kids are learning active shooter drills before they are old enough to learn how to read. That's what we're going to be up against. And so the task of the next president will be to face some of the most urgent crises that have ever come upon us as a nation with big, bold, serious ideas, get them done, and do it in a way that's actually going to have us more unified, not more divided, to galvanize and not polarize the American people to get these things done. Now, that sounds like a tall order, because it is. But I believe that's what the presidency is for. I believe the presidency exists for a reason, that it has a purpose, and that the purpose of the American presidency is not to glorify the president, it is to empower and unify the American people. And that is why I'm asking for your support.
That's the kind of presidency I want to offer you, one that can unite the American people, not by pretending we're all going to agree on everything. That's not the point. That's not even possible. But by agreeing on the values that guide this nation and then leading in a specific direction based on what those values mean. Think about a value like patriotism, the way we feel about the American flag and what that flag represents. Think about what motivated the people who I served with overseas who had that flag on their shoulder out of a desire to protect this country, out of a love of this country. Now, there's a lot more to that than the, the chest thumping of a president who thinks it's okay to throw out military justice and pardon war criminals as if there's no difference between a war criminal and a war fighter. That's not patriotism. When I talk about love of country, I'm talking about a love of country that begins with the understanding that our country is made of people. And you can't love a country if you hate half of the people in it. I'm talking about something deeper than that. I'm talking about a desire to protect this country abroad and right here at home. Keeping each other safe starts right here. That's why the time is upon us to make sure that no one can ever again twist the Second Amendment into an excuse to do nothing at all when it comes to life-saving measures and common-sense gun policy. <laughs> protecting our country means protecting the future. That's why we have to act and rise to meet the challenge of climate change as the global security threat of our time and lead the world in doing something about it. That's where patriotism is going to lead me and the presidency that I'm asking you to help me create. I see these very same values they're using to turn people against each other as the values that could bring us together. This is what they're doing with faith. They're using it to tell some people they don't belong. Now, let's begin with the principle that in America, our Constitution and our government belong to people of every religion and people of no religion equally. That is a founding principle of the United States of America. Well, let me be transparent with you about where my faith leads me. It leads me to desire a White House that you wouldn't have to look at as food stamps are cut and families are torn apart at the border and ask yourself, whatever happened to I was hungry and you fed me? Whatever happened to I was a stranger and you welcomed me? Whatever tradition, if any, you belong to, whatever happened to the idea of treating others as you would like to be treated, these are values that we all share, and God does not belong to a political party in the United States of America. Let's pay attention to values like the regard we have for work in this country. It is not honored by the ability of companies in Washington to lobby for the tax code to set up negative tax rates for some of the largest companies in the world. Companies making billions of dollars in profit that paid less, not just as a percent, but less in dollars, specifically zero, than you and I did last year on our federal income taxes. That's not showing regard for work. The way we show regard for work is to support workers and live up to the idea that one job ought to be enough in this country. talking about values like democracy. Democracy isn't just a system of government. It is a value. It is a moral idea that it matters that we see to it that every vote is counted and that every vote counts and that it's fair, which is why we've got to put an end to districts drawn by politicians who get to pick out their voters instead of the other way around. I've even gone way out on a limb and suggested in a democracy we might want to go ahead and pick our president one day by just counting up all of the votes and giving it to the person who got the most like we do in every other election in the United States of America. Seems like common sense, doesn't it? These are our values as a country and so is freedom. But let's make sure we follow that value of freedom where it requires us to go. It's not going to be enough to make us free to just cut every regulation and program and tax you've ever seen. It, freedom's more complicated than that. Sometimes freedom does mean getting government out of the way. I'm for getting government out of the business 
of dictating to women what their reproductive health care choices ought to be, for example. Other times it means the public sector's got to step up. That's what mayors and city councils know that they've got to do to make sure we provide the basic services that help make us free. That's why we build schools. And how about supporting our schools and our teachers with a secretary of education who believes in public education for once? And it's why the time has come for us to deliver health care for every American, because you're not free if you don't have it. That's why we've got to deliver Medicare for all who want it. Take a public plan, make it available for anybody who wants to have access to it, but trust you to decide whether you want it, because I think you're going to make the right decision for yourself and your family. That's how we solve the problem and honor our values at the same time. These are the values that guide us forward at a moment when we can't wait any longer. Can't wait 10 years, can't wait four years to solve these problems. We, we can't wait any longer to do something about climate change because we're this close to the point of no return. We can't any wait, wait any longer to do something about hate from an anti-Semitic attack on, a, on people celebrating a holiday in New York to a woman driving right here in Iowa thinking to herself, let me run over this girl because she looks different from me. We can't wait to put an end to that because hate has no home in the United States of America. We can't wait to act to make sure that in this country your race will have no bearing on your health or your wealth or your life expectancy or your relationship with law enforcement. That can't wait any longer. We've got to act now. This is crying out for action. The need to do something about long-term care and retirement savings is crying out for action. The voices of people with disabilities wanting to be able to contribute more and be in the workforce, crying out for action. We are crying out for action on issue after issue, and it can't wait any longer. This is our chance. One more thing that's crying out for action right now. The need for us to take as much by way of resources and speak just as openly as we do about any other medical issue, about addiction, substance abuse, and mental health, and bring that to the forefront of our medical and health, mental health system. This has to happen now. We can't wait. And the good news is the American people are already there on issue after issue. We just got to get Washington to follow up. And that's why I think the time has come to send in a mayor to get Washington to look a little more like our best-run cities and towns instead of the other way around. That's why I hope to be your president. And we're calling out to everybody to be part of this movement. I'm calling out to progressives, calling out to moderates, and I'm starting to meet an awful lot of what I like to call future former Republicans. And they need to know how welcome they are in this movement that we're building, because it's gonna take all of us to change what's going on in Washington. So, our gatherings have become a little less intimate than they were when I first turned up in Iowa, but I've never seen a room too big to have a conversation. So we got a couple folks running microphones. Go ahead and give a wave. One, two, three. They will come up to you. They'll, they'll hold the mic for you, and I'm going to call on as many folks as time will allow us to do. Just stick up a hand, and uh, let's hear what's on your mind. Let's start in this general. Yes, sir. Hi, Mayor Pete. Hello. Um, so my question is, with many norms being eroded away by our current president, what will you do to restore those norms and make sure others do not violate them? Thanks. It's, it's so important. Half the battle, I think, is what you don't do. There's so many things that presidents just didn't do, and uh, we, we didn't really have to think about it much. You, you, didn't, you didn't have to write a rule saying that the president of the United States should not attack a, a military family. Uh, a, a rule to say that the President of the United States shouldn't lie on a daily basis. Um, or fall back on a pattern of insult so out of control that even the dead are not safe from the insults of this President. 
So half of it's just going to be to not do any of those really bad things. That, that's a low bar, but that's half of it. But it's going to take more than that. Our norms and institutions are being smashed right and left. And we have a responsibility to build them back up. I envision a presidency that stands as a reminder to all of the American people that we belong to the same country, even when we have nothing in common but the fact that we belong to the same country. See, when the presidency's working well, you can look at the White House, you can look at the president, and even if you disagree, even if they're not of your party, if you, even if you wouldn't vote for them, still feel that the presidency, and therefore the White House, and therefore the country, belong to you. And I will be a president who sends that message to people who supported me and people who didn't. We can't go on like this. We've got to have a president who is committed to calling us to higher values. And wouldn't it be nice to have a president who, when you turned on the news, you'd feel your blood pressure go down a little bit instead of up to the roof? I also think policies would help. We don't have enough things in common in this country. And we don't even sometimes have the same facts when we turn on the TV because we're getting our news from different places. It's one of the reasons why I got a little heat from this in my own party. It's why I went on Fox News, because I can't blame a Fox News viewer for not understanding my message if they've never heard it. So we're going to cut across some of those silos, and we're going to reach out in different directions. And we're also going to make sure that we create more common experiences. When I was deployed, I came to trust my life to people who were so different from me, especially on politics. But because we had to work together on something hard, we, we learned to trust each other. I want every American to get that without having to go to war in order to have it. And that's why I believe in creating a million paid voluntary national service opportunities a year to create that touchstone of experience for a new generation so that we at least have that much in common. If we have a president getting up in the morning thinking about how to call this country together, just as a mayor gets up in the morning thinking about how to call a city together, then we will find that we can rebuild on the rubble some of those norms and institutions that have been smashed up and build them better than ever. And we're going to have to because our country is facing some tough, tough challenges in this century, and we're going to have to do it together. Thanks for the question. All right. Let's see a question right there. Um, my uh, ancestry is Latino. I have three Puerto Rican grandparents. And of course, I'm very concerned by the way that Puerto Rico and its citizens, who are US citizens, and in fact, all US citizens, are seeing a sort of gradation. There is such a yeah. thing as second class citizenship in the United States of America. Right. And I would like to know how you will tackle recreating a unified citizenship for us all. Yes. Thank you for speaking up to our, for our fellow U.S. citizens in Puerto Rico. And let's be clear, that's fellow U.S. citizens. <laughs> so in the territories, and especially in Puerto Rico, there's some steps we've got to take. First of all, that second-class citizenship is reflected in funding. So with things like Medicaid funding, the way it goes to the island is dramatically uh, worse off. And we've got to true that up and make sure that it's on par. Uh, same thing with disaster relief. The, the response to Hurricane Maria was shameful uh, in the refusal of this president uh, and administration to do the right thing, act fast, and help our fellow US citizens, some of whom are still suffering, some of whom are internally displaced persons, refugees, effectively. People I met with in Florida who had heartbreaking stories of having to flee, families torn apart by what happened not just by the storm, but by its aftermath. Uh, and we have a responsibility to make sure that no part of our country is left behind. The other thing that I think will make a big difference is political representation. Puerto Rico had electoral votes in the Electoral College. Uh, I'm pretty sure the response would have been a lot better to things like Hurricane Maria. We should deliver that. And if the people of Puerto Rico choose statehood, we should welcome that right away. But we shouldn't have to wait for that in order to have those electoral votes so that our fellow U.S. citizens have their voices heard in the election. <laughs> Quick side issue on that, by the way. The, the reverse is happening in the District of Columbia. We have electoral votes, but no real representation in the House and the Senate, as if uh, a, a worker in D.C. has any different problems or, or lesser problems than the rest of us. And by the way, D.C. would be the most African-American state in the Union if it were a state. 
The time has come there, too, to make sure there is proper political representation and not second-class citizenship. It's in the back. I'll try to get to you. Will you restore a position of skepticism toward the Soviet Union, I mean, towards uh, Vladimir Putin's Russia? Hmm. Well, I'll tell you this much. If it comes down to trusting the word of the American intelligence community or the word of Vladimir Putin, I'm betting on my fellow Americans any day. This relationship has only grown more complicated and more troubled. And we see everything from aggressive behavior in the region to interference in our elections and human rights abuses across Russia. And we got to stand up to that. Uh, it's the, the reality is both our competitors and our allies are often behaving in worse ways from Russia to Saudi Arabia because of the disappearance of US leadership. Now, we will look for ways to engage diplomatically and work together if possible. For example, Russia has signaled a willingness to engage on the New START treaty renewal, which would lead to less of a nuclear threat around the world, and we should enthusiastically uh, seek to engage there if we can uh, deliver a, a good, uh, good faith renewal of that agreement. But when we see the kinds of behavior and the pattern of aggression that we see there, we gotta be willing to stand up to it, and we will when I'm the President of the United States. All right, got front and center. Go ahead, the mic will find you. I am a mom of three young kids, so preventing tobacco use is really important to me. Um, E-cigarette use among youth is a public health crisis currently, with a total of five million U.S. kids now using them. These products are marketed in a wide, wide range of flavors like cotton candy, mango, mint, all to attract youth. If elected president, would you support eliminating all flavored tobacco products, including e-cigarettes and menthol cigarettes? And thank you for your service. Thank you. You're right. We see the use of these flavors in order to get younger and younger people uh, to use. And the health implications of these kinds of e-cigarettes are very serious, very problematic, and may require, regardless of flavor, uh, a lot more regulatory action the bottom line is it shouldn't be up to the government to prove that these products are unsafe. It should be up to these companies to prove that they are. And they also need to prove that they are not going to be targeting children. If they can't demonstrate that, and I'd say as of today they cannot, uh, then we should intervene, including intervening in the case of these flavors that are designed to make them more appealing, more accessible to young people and get them hooked for life. Question, Mr. Mayor. Oh, okay. No pressure. Last question. Um, how are you going to get things done, like Medicare for all who want it, if the rep if the Senate is mostly controlled by Republicans? Ah, smart question. Yeah. Very smart question. I'll tell you Plan B first, okay? Plan B works like this. The thing we got going for us is most Americans want to see these changes happen. Even compared to what President Obama had to work with 10 years ago, when he had more votes in the Senate than, than I will. Uh, but now we have more of the American people around many of these issues than he did. I mean, you think about Medicare for all who want it, for sure, the idea of making sure that we have that alternative. Even issues that Democrats used to really be on defense with, I'm thinking about uh, common sense gun law, for example. We're talking at least something like background checks. 80, 90% of Americans, most Republicans, most gun owners think we ought to do it because it's common sense. And so when a senator is getting in the way of a measure, whether it's that, whether it's a higher minimum wage, whether it's paid family leave, whether it's political reform, if the senator is getting in the way of that now, they are acting against the will of the people, even in conservative states. And so one of my favorite activities as president, when I find that one of these senators is getting in the way, will be to take that 
big blue and white airplane that comes with the Oval Office and fly it directly into the hometown or capital city of that senator and remind their voters of what's at stake and get them to explain why are they are defying their own voters on ideas that are not only part of my agenda, but popular with the American people, even in those conservative areas. In other words, it's not just going to be persuade. I'm all for trying to work across the aisle when we can. I'm on my third Republican governor, and we found ways to work together in, in different things. But sometimes you just got to go around them to their boss. And their boss is the people of whatever state sent them there. So that's plan B. Plan A is to be a nominee with an inclusive enough message in strong enough coattails coming from the, uh, the middle of America to see to it that Mitch McConnell is no longer the Senate majority leader and preferably not in the Senate at all. Well, I'm sorry that our time is up, but I will be in Iowa quite often over the five weeks between now and caucus day and i hope that we will continue to engage each other and i hope that you understand now not just how i propose to win but where i think our country needs to go that that day i was i was telling you about uh, we can't wait for any of these things to happen and i want to close by just asking this of you as i watch the news in washington i know there is a temptation to a feeling of exhaustion like you're watching this impeachment stuff right and it's just exhausting Especially when you think that it might get to, get to that Senate and it'll be a foregone conclusion. And it makes us feel that temptation to just give in and switch the whole thing off and walk away. But that's when the cynics win. The great thing about 2020, the great thing about the year that is about hmm, almost uh, 30 hours away, is that's the year when it's up to us. No matter what happens on the floor of the Senate, it's up to us to do something. And when we do, we're going to be able to look back on 2020 and have a sense of pride about what we did. I know it sounds funny to talk about pride and politics in the same sentence. Just like it's, it's kind of funny to talk about hope these days. But I am propelled by a sense of hope. You can't run for office without it. Running for office is an act of hope. That's why they call us candidates the, the 2020 hopefuls. Running for office is an act of hope, and so is caucusing, so is knocking on doors, so is voting itself. So can I look to you to spread that sense of hope to everybody you know and draw them into this process? And are you ready to take our future back into our hands? And can I count on your support in the caucuses five weeks from tonight? Iowa, I believe you are going to make me the nominee and the next president of the United States. When you do, I will work to make you proud, and we will make history together. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your support, and thank you for caring about the future of our country. Thank you.